Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. This episode is a part of our Kitchen Side series, where we pull back the curtain and show you the behind-the-scenes conversations, debates, strategies, and brainstorming sessions that we have at our agency. In this episode, we talked about a concept known as eating from a smaller plate. This is a mental model as well as a budgeting method that facilitates the whole do less with more, <laughs> do more with less thinking. In fact, the point that we come to during this discussion is that actually constraints are good. An unbridled spend and bloat is a lot more dangerous than scrappiness, as scrappiness tends to lead to creativity and unconventional thinking, as well as prioritization. We also cover unhinged LinkedIn takes on SEO, a classic. Anyway, this was a great conversation. Let's dive in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, we're live. We got yeah. a couple of things on the docket that I think we have a lot of things to say about. Where do we want to start? What are we? What, are we? Um, what is on the docket? We've got unhinged, uh, transparent LinkedIn post. Um, Let's start there. He calls it the SEO heist. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing, dude. <laughs> so proud. I, I think it's hilarious. Do you know what? Let's start, start there. Maybe like, Alex, you, you set the context for what exactly we're talking about and what this LinkedIn post is that we saw. <laughs> There's this guy, uh, Jake Ward, um, who posted a pretty popular take on LinkedIn. It was like the slideshow. And the text headline is how we stole 2.3 million SEO traffic from a competitor. And the headline on the... Um, the slideshow or the carousel is SEO heist for 2.3 million traffic. And if you go through it, it's like we pulled off the following SEO heist using AI. We exported a competitor's sitemap with all of their URLs. We turned their article URLs into article titles. And then we created 1,800 articles from those titles at scale using AI. And I thought this was so funny and um, transparent and brazen that it caught my attention because of course what you're going to see, like it, you're going to see a bunch of comments that are just roasting this. Right. And that's like pretty much what happened. A lot of people were like, I don't know if this is something to applaud. <laughs> like, this is financially great, but this is kind of scamming. And you told an AI to copy blah, 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 blah. And so there's, there's the funny side. The funny side for me is that, it's, it's honest and like actually probably a lot of people do this or would love to do this. You know what I mean? But they'll yeah. never just like say it. So I did, I actually commend, I thought it was kind of um, not, not respectable, I guess that's probably the wrong word, but I thought it was like, at least you're saying it, you know, yeah. at least you're not like hiding behind some like morality. Uh, it's like, yeah, sure. I have mixed feelings on this because technically people do do competitor analysis and they try to steal keywords from competitors and, Maybe they do use AI to produce some of that content. And I applaud that this guy was able to do this and execute on that whole process and publish all that content and do it in a way where they actually grew traffic. The part that feels slimy is like, oh, you lit you probably had no you did not do your original thinking on the strategy and you literally just like scraped the website and redid all the content. That's the part I think where it's like, I guess there's an Lack of integrity, maybe? You hit on the two points that I wanted to bring this up be because of, like, I wanted to bring up these two points. The first is morality. It's clearly not I an ideal situation, integrity-wise, to pump out a bunch of content of which you know nothing about. Like, I don't know what they did for editorial fact-checking. Maybe there was a whole process there. But it's clearly not good for the internet. The emergent property of all of this information being ranked by somebody that doesn't know anything about the topic is not good for the public. Like, if you just think, so there's the um, Immanuel Kant, right? The great philosopher had the universal principle, um, which I'm going to butcher this. It's going to be dumbed down and simplified. But if you think about, like, one action, uh, you know, maybe it's like, I want to litter. Like, you think, what if everybody did this? And if everybody did this and it's a bad thing, like, you shouldn't do it once, right? Like, that's, like, kind of the universal principle of moral actions. And, like... You know, if you can do this, would you love that if everybody did this too? Would that be a good internet? Would that be a good information ecosystem? Fuck no. Like, clearly the answer is no, right? Yeah. This just is noise to me. Like, obviously, it's eye-catching and 
maybe at a micro level, it teaches interesting tactics. Like if you were a content team of one or you were just building your website and you needed to like lay a somewhat of a foundation, not 2.3 million visitors of a foundation, but it just feels icky to me. And like the, the writer and like the human <laughs> internet user in me is like, oh, I wonder how this even contributed to like real business metrics. Traffic's well, great, it whatever. clearly didn't because you can see in the screenshots all of the topics are like random, like right. long tail Excel formula type topics. Right. So it's not like it's, but it, it is a cool thing to say like, oh, we did get traffic this way. I think just human interest wise, that's that's kind of fascinating. The thing that David you said around competitive analysis, there was a comment that he, he replied to somebody who was like, hey, like I don't know, you said you stole, like this isn't cool. He responded, stealing quote, stealing happens all the time, especially in SEO. Most strategies will incorporate looking at the competitor's keywords, at the keywords the competitor's ranking for, and then using that to write their own content. Um, so basically, it was justifying by saying, like, people do this manually, and mm -hmm. therefore using AI to do this is no different. And I think that brings up a deeper point about, it, it seems like there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what SEO is, or like, what, what good SEO strategy is. Like, to me, that's like, yeah, like if you looked at it on the surface, like if you, like the cargo cult phenomenon, you know, if you just looked at the surface level of what's happening, you you would believe that yeah, that you're just copying competitors and like beefing it up a little bit and let's sky skyscrapering it. But that's not like what effective SEO strategy is that maps to business strategy. That's like to me, there's like a weird disconnect there. Mm -hmm. to, to clarify, he didn't take the content and use AI to rewrite it. He took the topics and plugged like the high level topics and then wrote new pieces, correct? Yeah, I think so. So he didn't like, yeah. necessarily steal competitor content. He just did competitive analysis at scale without any human thought. <laughs> yeah. Which is still yeah. icky, but it's not stealing necessarily. It's just what we do on a much bigger, faster, less yeah. human level. I, and I think the part that I'm, I, again, I applaud that he was able to execute on this. That's dope i think a lot of people who say they want to do programmatic want to do a very similar thing but it started off with we stole what our competitor is doing and we tell every client that you should not just copy competitors blindly like yep. it assumes that they're doing the correct they have the correct seo and content strategy and if they do it may not apply to your business or like your icp or whatever go to market you have and maybe in some cases like you should just copy but it didn't seem like there was that thinking of how it maps to, like, I guess for any clients or people building SEO and content strategies, I'm like, don't go and just do this. Like, try to map it to business value before you go producing 1,800 articles um, yeah. based on competitive research. Because I can imagine if it's just a bunch of, like, Excel keywords. One, there's a lot of search volume around those keywords. And two, unless if you are Microsoft it doesn't really matter if you're ranking for Excel related keywords. But that's why I think there's such a misunderstanding or a gap and a misapplication of what this is um, into like what a real business would do. And I'm saying that like a little bit condescendingly uh, because like future proofing, first off, if you can do this, anybody can do this. And Dr. Theo Dossetto had mentioned that, which is like the most obvious like thinking gap there. So like if you're SAP, if you're Salesforce, you're probably not going to do this, right? Like that's just a ridiculous strategy with no moat. The second thing is the future of SEO and like generative search answers like that. Like I can go to chat GPT and it's going to give me Excel formulas. It's fucking amazing at doing that. Mm -hmm. So like doing this type of content is probably not where you're going to get the best uh, like business advantage or moat or leverage. Um, there's no information gain. You're not giving anything new to the topic. And therefore, that's the exact type of content that AI is just going to destroy. Like, there's going to be no value in doing that. If, if there is now, there's probably, I, I would, I hate predictions, but I would imagine that's the first thing that's going to go out the window. <laughs> it's funny that AI is going to cut itself out. No, that's amazing. That's why I'm so optimistic about AI. No, I know. It's just like, if you use search generative experience, you're probably not going to get AI written content, which is, oh, yeah. which mm. is funny to me. <laughs> you use AI and you probably aren't going to get AI, which is good. Good thing. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of a fun take, our, our weekly LinkedIn rundown. <laughs> um, let's talk about something substantive. Interesting, interesting how <laughs> SEO strategies uh, become a basis for philosophical <laughs> discussions <laughs> on moral, morality and integrity. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of larger business practices. 
Have you seen, by the way, there's this whole take like nowadays, that, like uh, backlinks don't matter. I mean, people have talked about that for a while, but um, I saw one take. Yeah, it was something about like uh, somebody analyzed a bunch of big websites like HubSpot and whatnot, NerdWallet, and was like, hey, I found the biggest correlation wasn't backlinks. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. It was content velocity. And then people chimed. I didn't want to chime in, but like (laughs) we worked at HubSpot. And we built backlinks. We we spent a lot. We had a team teams that did it. Like, a lot of people were. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, it, personally, personal experience says you're wrong. Absolutely wrong. But then a bunch of people in the comments were like, I can tell you firsthand that all of these companies are building links. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just funny. Why like does this it have to be like so black and white. Like, why can't you just do a little bit of everything and figure out what works best for you and change like your breakdown? Maybe it's like. 25% velocity, 10% back. Yeah. Like, why can't it be all? Why is it black and white? Do you know the answer to that question, There's, Alex? Well, do you want to know the answer? Sure. But you look at, like, the financial incentives of somebody saying something. So, like, the people who are pushing these things are typically pushing a product. Oh, Jake yeah, Ward yeah. is yeah. involved in ByWord, the AI copywriting tool. Right. Um, the per- I won't throw him under the bus, but the person who wrote the rundown on content velocity and, you know, shit on backlinks... Um, they're running a product that helps you do content velocity. Right. So no, there's who, always an agenda. Yeah. yeah. Like if you're if you if you have a strong dogmatic take and you say this is the only way, like just follow the thre- thread and, and look at how they make money on that take. Yeah. That's the that's the real answer. Well, yeah. My question was more rhetorical for like marketers or anybody listening. Like it's not black and white. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. We have no agenda in saying this. We're I actually had a client. Things. I had a client be like, hey, if we invested more in content and SEO and therefore with Omniscient, what would that look like? Like, is it even worth it? And I'm sure he said, like, and I'm sure you're going to find a way to say it's worth it to invest more. And I paused. and I was like, not necessarily. Like, I'm going to do some research, but I'm not going to tell you to dump money in it just because I want you to pay us more. Like, I might say you should fix your paid campaign. Um, But I was like kind of caught off guard. He said that. And he was like, I don't mean that in like a brazen way, like. Just that you're you're likely going to find a way to. Like, he was trying to walk it back, and I was like, "No, I get it. Like, it's good for you to be skeptical of your agency partner wanting to sell you on things that may not make sense for you, but I'm not going to do that." So, yeah, that's the true I'm embodiment of, of the that. concept of the long game that we we came up with the, a while back, and it's one of those things that it's so easy to say, like, "I play the long game. I'm in it for the long game." I'm but in really, the arena. <laughs> I'm in the arena. <laughs> But no, the hard part is when it comes down to it and you do find a short-term trade-off where you're like, hey, I could pump up the numbers and make this forecast look amazing and I could try to sell this client. Well, what happens in three or six months when those results aren't coming and you intellectually knew that the whole time that wasn't going to be a feasible route for their success? Yeah, That's what it means to play the long game. It's like not taking those short-term trade-offs. I've turned down more clients than I've I've pitched in, in terms of sales because I'm like, fundamentally, if you invested $10,000 a month, in the course of two, three, four years, given yeah. your competitive landscape and your maturity, you're not going to be able to make this work. You have to do X, Y, and Z first. Yeah, I'm actually kind of in this predicament right now where I had a call with a boutique consulting firm and they just redesigned their site, new URL and everything, zero DR. And they're like, yeah, we're a boutique consulting firm and like their competitors like Slow Loam, which is like one of the biggest consulting firms out there. And I'm like, Oh, you're not gonna organic's not gonna work for you, dude. Like at least not for the next two to three years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was like, don't focus on organic. You should think about this, like thought leadership and finding ways to distribute that content instead. Um, but now I'm just like, should I even be pitching this guy? Like maybe he should be figuring out a way to produce that internally. So yeah. these are the types of predicaments I have where I'm like, I could make a case, but should I be? Mm-hmm. And versus just blanket sending a proposal to everyone. Yeah. Everybody's in their own race. That's, yeah. that's the interesting thing. It's just I was if thinking about the... run someone else's race, I have to be able to say, like, we can't help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that, actually, from the broader context of, like, how do you know what information is worth trusting, which David and I talked about on yesterday's Kitchen Side, where we talked about the surround sound, and, like, yeah. how do people get information, and how do they say this brand is worth checking out and this one's not worth checking out how did you know like what does gartner report you know like all of those things that factor into consumer decision making (laughs) and something i think about a lot because i consume a lot of information is how do i weight that information who do i follow how do i find the signal versus the noise 
And I wrote a blog post a long time ago on marketing advice, and it talked all about this advice problem, uh, because a lot of advice is good, but only for a certain subset of the audience. So in experimentation, CRO, there used to be kind of two sides of the equation. There would be this one side, a lot of agencies and smaller businesses who would be like, you got to do all the customer research, craft the perfect test. If you test button colors, you are a dumbass. You are a terrible CRO. And then on the other side were enterprises who were espousing a test everything mentality because they're like, you want to eliminate the risk of a bad product ship, of a bad future ship, of a bad change. There's a bigger risk in not testing it than there is in just the cheap cost of testing everything because they've got greater infrastructure. And I was like, both of them are right. Yeah. You know? Because I'm seeing a lot of advice nowadays about from smaller businesses uh, that say they're like, you know, organic SEO. It's like that's the old world. Like you're not going to go after keywords. And like there's there's this old traditional playbook, and that's that's not cool for the modern world, right? The modern world is all about it's like like LinkedIn or whatever. It's like about zero click content on social, and it's and about then, and then LinkedIn podcasting. changes the algo, and you're fucked. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? That actually is a totally valid thing because if you're starting from scratch, you're going to get much faster traction doing those tactics or doing a podcast where you're talking one on one with your target audience. But like if you're a massive corporation, like we've seen firsthand the value of old school SEO, bread and butter SEO, boring SEO, backlinks, technical analysis, internal linking and content production is really effective and drives such fi- like it's it's such enormous growth. And it's like these small, boring micro changes that like would never work on the smaller business side. So it's like both are right. Yeah. It's just like, who are you listening to and like what context are they operating from? Because the advice that they're giving is coming from their context. Speaking of things that don't work anymore, Ali, you had mentioned, <laughs> you, you mentioned, oh. a, you said a statement that I was like, wait, what? You said that long form gated content won't work anymore. And I was like, wait, oh, I think I disagree. And you're like, well, there's nuance. I'm like, okay, yeah, so I'm let's go. What, you what's like your take a... on long form gated content? So just to clarify, this is a piece of advice that doesn't work for everyone. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, we've been working on quite a few conversion focused content projects for clients. So it really just come out of personal experience, team experience, and just feedback we've gotten, as well as the data that we've seen. Um, but I've thought for a while that long form written gated content, so ebooks, when people just repurposed a blog post behind a gate, that shit doesn't work anymore, in my opinion. And I'm talking about like high level how to's, ultimate guides to, et cetera. Because a couple things. One, I can probably find that elsewhere that's on a blog post. And there's no unique value to downloading something. So from a user perspective, I think the value of that has gone down. And at the end of the day, when you think about it from like a lead and sales perspective, like that person that's downloading something that's super high level, super like fundamental how to 101, the the tie between like that mindset to like, I'm ready to purchase software. So I'm speaking in the B2B realm, right? I don't, that's a very long road. Like there's not, those two people are not the same thing. Um, Like for us, sorry. For us, we've, when we were doing content marketing early on, we were like, how to do keyword research, how to do content audit, et cetera, et cetera. We realized like, sure, this content is helping people, right? But that person's probably not gonna be the person that can buy our services. So we're thinking about it from like B2B software perspective. Um, And what we've seen is, you know, a lot of people had that trope of like, just turn it into a PDF and gate it, turn it into a PDF and gate it. I don't think that works anymore. So that's my like hot take, and I I don't think it's that hot. What do you all think? I I would like to maybe do a little devil's advocate if that's cool with you. Okay. So you had two different sides, uh, two different arguments. One, it's not effective be- because it doesn't work because like it's it's like kind of a tautological thing. It's like it, it, doing that type of content does not convert because they. Your answer was because they can find it elsewhere. I would question if they know they can find it elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuance to the the mindset and the awareness of the person searching for this information, right? So if we're if we're speaking from like a B two B lens, Martech, etc., um, 
I don't I don't think that there's anything unique enough about this high level gated ebook content to warrant downloading something when you know, like the ultimate guide to content marketing. I mean, you can find that in a lot of different places. I mean, you can Google it and find it, right? So I'm talking like that type of written content. So maybe they don't have an awareness of how how the internet works and they think this is the only place they can find an ultimate guide. Or there's a but, convenience factor. They just don't want to go fishing for it, right? Like if you're on a blog post about how to do keyword research and there was a, so this old term content upgrade is kind of an ebook mm-hmm. or gated offer that relates to the piece at hand. Yep. If you had a gated offer that was like, here's a 95 point keyword research checklist, you know, you can find a keyword research checklist. I could Google that right now and I'm sure I could find one. But like if it's, if it's in a pop up on that page mm-hmm. while you're reading it, so that like is an might. exception to my argument. And I, I think I'm not against gated content. Like you can imagine how interesting our work, our jobs would be if the only CTA we had to work with was talk to sales. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would make our job quite difficult. So I think gated content is a great play. Um, I'm more speaking of the turn it into a PDF and put it behind a gated wall play uh, that we see people play. Are you speaking, my interpretation is you might be speaking to the misalignment of like search intent where it's like, just because you turn something into a PDF and someone downloads it doesn't mean that they're a qualified lead because it might just be like some top of funnel content turned into a PDF. That was the second part of my argument from like the business value perspective. I don't think that has value for for your sales team. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that side too, actually. I don't know if, David, you had more on the first part. I was just going to use like a tangible example, like... Oh, you were saying like the ultimate guide to content marketing, like a CMO isn't going to probably isn't going to download that, but maybe someone who's like kind of new where to content marketing might like this speculation, maybe the CMO might like who isn't familiar with content marketing might download it. Um, but if you're trying to sell into a company that you're trying to sell like a content marketing software to a company, if someone search like wants to understand what content marketing is or doesn't know what it is, they're probably like very early in the customer journey Mm -hmm. where maybe somewhere down the line they want to use your product but if they're just learning about what content marketing is they're not going to want your content marketing software maybe that's and that's why a lot of companies i think they'll generate all these leads they'll call it but those leads don't turn into like sales qualified deals or pipeline or anything Mm -hmm. i will say that most companies most content and seo programs under index on more of the down funnel and more of the quote unquote serious business CTAs. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's uh, doing the upper funnel stuff is not without merit. Like if you just look at like our context, um, let's say like, so the target targeting is still important, right? The content that you write about still should reach your target audience or adjacent stakeholders who may be involved in the decision process, but take a piece like the ultimate guide to content marketing some business leaders, some VPs might stumble upon that, right? And they might find a checklist. They're probably, that doesn't indicate any buying signals. Like that doesn't say that mm-hmm. they're ready to like talk to sales. But what it does is it gives you their email address for nurturing, right? Like you can give them more information. You can sign them up for an email newsletter. Mm-hmm. But it also gives you a lot of their data. So with HubSpot or Marketo or basically any marketing automation platform or CMS, like you, it's really easy to do this stuff nowadays. Once you have an email address, you can look at the behavior on the website and you can say, I actually have triggers set up in HubSpot that after we've collected somebody's email address, I can see when they visit, say, our best B2B SEO agency's blog post or our contact us page or our case studies. And then those two signals in combination, even if they haven't filled out the contact us form or a deeper funnel asset, say, that actually might be worthwhile. I might, I might want to reach out to them. So like you start to you start to build a data profile of the person, even though that first touch point may not have been um, an indicator that they're ready to buy. So they're definitely not yeah. a sales qualified lead at that touch point, but that touch point does give you the means to like do data enrichment and actually figure out when they are. Yeah, gated content is still incredibly valuable, uh, yeah. especially coming from our perspective being conversion focused. Like I don't I don't only want to have a talk to sales CTA to work with. That doesn't give us a lot of. Uh, wiggle room when it comes to producing content. I think gates are very valuable. I think I'm looking at it from the lens. Like I've had a couple clients ask me, like what what types of gated content are worth investing in? If I have none, you know. And I think like if we're looking at high level guides, 
I can't say that that's the first thing I would I would pitch. Um, I think something more actionable, like you said, checklist, template, dashboard, even like a free tool or a quiz, something that can help them do their job better. And sure, it's a quick fix, but if anything, it highlights how a quick fix isn't as sustainable of a solution as the product itself. Something tangential that solves a problem, but ultimately doesn't help as much as the product does. Um, if it is going to be a long form guide, maybe something original research, something that can really drive links to that landing page. I think we've seen a lot of success with the clients that we've built original research reports for. Some gated, mm -hmm. some aren't, but ultimately not only does it help add emails, right, collect data, but also the links, right? And then the third, the third heuristic I'll use is something unique, something original, provocative, like contrarian. If you're gonna write a guide, make it a different perspective on what's already out there, something that only your team, your executive, your brand point of view, only you can deliver. Maybe it's still a 20 page ebook, but make it something that's worth downloading and reading. And then you can build that trust more so than a high level blog or a high level blog turned into an ebook. Yeah, that's not like find elsewhere. the ultimate guide to keyword research, but we interviewed exactly. 56 SEO experts about keyword research and they, yeah. they revealed their secrets or something like that. <laughs> Or why X Y Z doesn't work anymore, like something like that. That you're like, oh, I actually like, I want, I can't find this anywhere else. I will give you my email and I will read it, and that is more likely to be an MQL. It's cool because I think people overdo it on the brand journalism storytelling angle when it comes to blog content and like getting people to the site. But this is actually the point at which you would you would build content with those mental models in mind. You would really think from a consumer interest standpoint. Mm -hmm. It seems like this. The two questions that are critical to answer then for this, like, if you're going to gate something is like, the goal of gating is to capture the contact information. So then the next question is like, does this topic capture the right people? Or like, what is the likelihood we will capture the right type of persona with this topic? Um, I was just talking to Braden Becker about this on, on another interview. And it's like, yeah, you might have to t have an educated guess of like, this topic is probably going to bring in a lot of like, unqualified people or like the wrong type of people, but it might capture like 10% of those people might be like our target buyer. And then the second question is like, are there any buying signals? Like mm. does, does this, is this topic related to a pain point that our product <laughs> solves for? Like, mm -hmm. do they have that pain point that they're trying to solve for? And then like, if they do have that pain point, that's probably a signal that they're looking for a solution. Like, I guess if you can somehow answer those two questions and have some confidence level around them like that might determine whether or not you should create that as a gated well article. i really think that the channel growth strategy has much more to do with the, the audience you're bringing in than the conversion strategy does mm. i think that the conversion strategy is like it's got to be marginally more useful than the content that you just read again mm -hmm. to ali's point a quiz a tool a product demo like something that they get in addition to like what they've surfaced but like more like you're not going to People are already on the blog post. They've already found it in search or social or whatever your, again, channel growth strategy is. That's where you're attracting the right audience, mm -hmm. not the conversion point. This is really good. This is making me think a lot about how we frame this stuff. Do you guys remember stuff. when I told you about, uh, I think I told you about this, Alex, about the, the fiction writing podcast I listened to and how she did like a quiz to do mm -hmm. like, a podcast playlist. I just yeah, yeah. posted it on LinkedIn. <laughs> But I think it's it was such a brilliant idea. Essentially, for listeners, I listened to another podcast called Fiction Writing Made Easy. <laughs> and she has like over 250 episodes. And they're not episodic, but they definitely like connect. So it's hard to figure out where to plug in and how to get the best help. And I think a ton of listeners are in different stages, right? Some people are have written a book, some people haven't written anything. Um, and I got this email from her a few months ago that was like, fill out this form and I'll give you a custom podcast playlist. And it was four questions. And this is a little bit different than the use case that we're talking about with B2B and all that stuff, but it it was an immediate, like I immediately did the form. And mm -hmm. it gave me a playlist of like 15 episodes, nothing compared to her whole podcast. And she knew exactly where I was in her quote unquote funnel. What questions mm -hmm. did she ask you, if you remember? <clears throat> um, you know, how, where are you on your fiction writing journey? Like, hmm. haven't written anything, just trying to listen, have a first draft, have a finished book, I've already worked with you. Um, what what genre are you writing? Because some of her episodes are genre specific. Um, stuff like that for her to better understand like where I was in my 
journey, I guess. Oh, it's like a lead qualification for Exactly. It, and it I'm is, sitting yeah. here being like, she probably has so much data. And now she can put me in a list on her email marketing and target me with other types of downloads or other opportunities. So I rarely talk about tactics um, because I think people who want the just give them, just give me the tactics. People are very boring, and as soon as you give the tactics, like it gets flooded, so then it's no longer effective. But in B two B, I still think the quiz is massively underutilized. Like it's it's very common in D two C, especially um, some of the popular like flashy new brands and e commerce to a certain extent. But bar- barely anybody's doing this in B two B, and I think there's a lot of untapped Wait, potential let's, there. Let's talk about this because the B two B quote quizzes I've seen are more like surveys like hey we want to survey agency owners about these this topic which they're probably going to collect information about us to see if they want to sell us some agency software or something (laughs) but the quiz that you took Allie was around like hey I'm going to give you some recommendations based on what you give me so yeah I'm wondering they do surveys in b2b but how do you make it a quiz where there's like more reason to fill it out versus just giving them information first for i think you got to give them something at the end like yeah this case, Spiro i got a pod i got a uh, shopify, shopify spotify podcast playlist of like the episodes that were most pertinent to where i was in my fiction writing journey mm-hmm. i mean we could do that with our podcast we could i mean a lot of b2b companies have podcasts they have media <laughs> We did do that. We just technically didn't actually launch it. We, we have the type of form. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, I've also seen quizzes like ROI calculator and stuff like that. So it's like a free tool plus a quiz. So you get something out of it. But like it does give the business information about where you are and some of your data. So I, I think there needs to be something waiting for you at the end of the quiz. Maturity that's curves, too. To that's, uh, Spiro uh, did that with the CRO maturity curve, or experimentation mm-hmm. maturity curve. Like They had a whole model built out, and like you could see where you fit on that. Maturity curves and ROI calculators are the most common ones I've seen in B2B. Mm-hmm. Although I do think there may be a little bit of skepticism from the user as they approach those, because like if you fill out an ROI calculator, it's, it's always, it's always going to be like, yeah. oh, if you use this tool, your business dollars. is going to 5x. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> As if, but there's like, this is the ro- this is where the cr- the room for creativity is. Yeah, it's like you don't have to do those. This is where you can get fun. Like this is where the kind what of media like thinking a, comes in. A blog, like a blog, li- like a blog list. Like which hey, SEO hey. celebrity are you? <laughs> yeah, or like Buzz hey, think like, Buzzfeed. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yes, there, you can there, still collect so amazing information. There. Through the, the, the guise of a fun quiz. You can collect fucking great information. BuzzFeed has so much information for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, there should yeah, be like, there's a what, lot to do here. The, the continent SEO archetypes, like which one are you? <laughs> or the, I like uh, it. Yeah, stuff like nice, that. It's great. The kind quiz. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, a good example, and this is more consumer. I think they do have a B2B. They probably have a B2B play as Masterclass. Um, if you land on on any of their blog posts, the, their, their main CTA is a, a multi-step quiz that puts you into the product itself. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good variant away from eBooks, kind of in the same like immediately actionable gated asset vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like if you ask a B2B software company, like, yeah, if we gave you no additional budget, what would you do creatively, like get information, like get leads? You can't, you can't just throw more paid ads at it. Quizzes. Maybe that's yeah. it. I think uh, this is kind of related to what you want to talk about, Alex. Eating from a smaller plate from Andrew Wilkinson. <laughs> yeah, this, this is going to be a little bit more highfalutin and philosophical, I think. <laughs> but let's dive into it. Yeah, so. let's get philosophical. Yeah, um, love Andrew Wilkinson, love MetaLab, fantastic agency. Um, he was on the My First Million podcast and was talking about this mental model of basically like if you're trying to lose weight, maybe just eat from a smaller plate. Like maybe just buy a bunch of smaller plates because then you can only fit a certain amount of food on it. And this was in relation to he's got a portfolio of businesses. I think his parent company is called Tiny, right? And they, they have Meta Lab and they've got a bunch of other businesses um, and they hire CEOs to run these businesses. And he was talking about how like, oh, if you're like 
net profit margin, if the average net profit margin in this industry is like 10% or 20%, like how do you guys do 40%? Like how, how is that possible? And his mental model was eat from a smaller plate. So what we do is we take 40% or whatever like our target margins are. And this could apply to different areas. This could apply to like, uh, you know, like our agency business, or this could apply to like the money you're going to spend on advertising. But you portion that off. He puts it in a different bank account and they have it like they can still if they really need to like break glass in case of emergency, they can still access that. But then the CEO has to come to them and be, be like, hey, we we really need to like break into some of this. Right. But otherwise, it's off the table. It's it's almost like the pay yourself first principle that financial advisors say. It's like, hey, before you uh, ever partition any of your money for like your budget areas, put 10 percent or 20 percent or whatever it is into your savings account. And don't touch it. Like that's just that's your savings account. That's your investment account. That's going to grow over time, and you don't even think about it. So I, I really liked that mental model. Yeah, is it like the idea of not just for business owners who want to be more profitable, but for I guess marketing teams who are trying to do more with less? Like set the constraint. Maybe this is an, an exercise they should have been doing before all the layoffs and market shifts of like, how do we do more and not have to spend more money? Mm -hmm. People are so, um, people struggle so much with prioritization and productivity and focus. But I think when you place key constraints and big goals, like you need both of those two, you need like the big why, like what you want to accomplish. And then you need constraints that like, uh, sort of make it so you don't have this endless buffet in front of you where, where you could do everything and you, you try sometimes to do everything and then nothing works. Yeah. So from like I, I was talking to you, David, on non-business call, like our accountability group uh, earlier this week. I was like, you know, for the first time that I remember, I'm really running into the constraint of not being able to do everything I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And there's two really like the two, like two big things that I'm aiming at right now, outside of loving relationships and all that stuff, is um, the the business. We have goals in terms of our metrics and our revenue. And then jujitsu, like I'm into jujitsu now. And it's one of those things that you actually have to apply yourself. You can't be a, a dilettante. You can't fuck around. Like you got to go a certain amount of times per week. So I set goals on how many times I want to go per week, just given the goals of like, oh, like usually takes this long to be a blue belt. Like maybe I can like bump that up a little bit if I do this. And what that is, is like, so it, that's more of a upper aim. So like, so let's say I'm doing four classes a week. If you look at it from the time constraints or like the margin constraints that Andrew Wilkinson said, what I'm actually doing is I'm capping my time. Uh, because if I go four times a week, that necessarily means that I'm not going to be able to do certain other things. So then my priorities just naturally align because then it's like, okay, like when am I going to do those classes? Like I'm either going to do them in the night or at noon. Those are kind of like the times that I have. So I'm going to do them at noon because then I can have extra optionality and I have to do different things that I want to do. That means I have to shift around this in my schedule. Oh, and also, by the way, that means that I probably can't drink much. Because if I'm hungover, like I'm probably not going to go to class. So that rules that out. Now I don't even need to think about that. And it's like, well, now that I'm doing this during noon, my workday is constrained. So I'm probably not going to fuck around on Twitter. Like, because if I did, then that would take away from the two big goals that I have. So it's like by by chunking that out and being like, here's like, un like, I'm not going to argue with this time. I'm going to do these two things. Then everything else just it falls away if it's not contributing to that. So the key is to have like one like a North Star or one to two. You have yeah. to like model most everything else around. The North Star gets you out of bed and then like the 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 constraints or like the inputs are I think where you get the benefit from the smaller plate thinking. So it's like if you wanted to grow your business from five to ten million dollars and you set a constraint on let's say the number of employees that you were gonna hire to do that, well what does that what does that mean? That means that you're not going to be able to just hire and like headcount your way out of that problem. You're going to have to do so through other means. You're going to have to make your business more business more efficient. You're going to have to work on raise your pricing, raising pricing, or like you know ret like retention. There's a bunch of other ways you can solve that. But what it does is it takes one one common way to solve that away, and that's what Andrew Wilkinson's thing does too. Is like if you're not spending thirty, forty percent, whatever, like your net profit margin is then you have to solve your business problems a different way. You can't just spend it and then hit the average, the industry average, like, because he doesn't want to be average there. That's like, you know, like the goal is to be on average in a good way. Yeah, I see it as a mix of a combination of goals, priorities, and constraints. Like if your goal is to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, that is likely your priority. It's a priority to go to classes and your 
time constrained. But you put on a calendar, like I think we, all, the three of us have gym time and exercising on a calendar. And maybe we have to move it around, but for me, I'm like, minimum, I'm going to the gym three times a week. It might be three times during the week or two times over the weekend and once during the weekdays, but I'm going minimum three times. And that's like a non-negotiable. I've, I've talked to Lisa, my partner about it. I'm like, I have to go to the gym three times. Like, I feel like shit if I don't. And we make it happen. Like maybe some days I'm like, there's a social or there's a dinner I'm invited to. I'm like, can't go, gotta go to the gym. But the combination of goals, like clear priorities and having those constraints, I think is, is helpful in like personal and business. The other, the flip side to all of this is like the, I think it's actually a controversial idea if people really thought about it, but the controversial idea that bloat is actually not a good thing. Like I, I think it's a curse to be overrun with money or time or like optionality. I think it's actually a much better thing for your long-term success to be constrained in certain ways. I, I think I saw it, <laughs> there was like a, tw- a tweet about like New York City sanitation or something like that. And they, we're like yelling at Ralph Lauren on Twitter for like putting their trash out or so, something like that. And then I saw somebody quote tweeted it and they're like, we should do an audit of all companies with Twitters that do this because this is a sure sign of bloat and corruption, right? If they're not actually doing their job and like cleaning that up, like they're on Twitter, like doing this bullshit, like that's not effective. That's like public shaming, you know, it's like, what is that going to do? Yeah. So I think like when people are overrun with options and money or, or whatever like that is, like they start to do wasteful activities. Yeah, or analysis paralysis, they make no decision. Mm-hmm. What if you only had $5,000 to spend on SEO? Like, what if you were only going to write 10 new posts a month instead of 100? Like, then you. So, I have, a, I have a question for you. How would a constraint change how you'd approach a goal? What do you like, mean? If you only have $5,000 to spend on SEO, and, but you have a, like, someone has set a goal, or you, you know, your team has set a goal. How would you corroborate those two things if the goal was almost too much, too high with what you have to work with? Well, if the goal is too high for what you have to work with, then, I mean, you have to be honest about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's no way that I could go, let's say, like, from white belt to blue belt in jiu-jitsu after three months. Unless I, like, literally went, like, twice a day, (laughs) three times a day, every day. You know, and even then, like, it it probably wouldn't happen. So, like, that's... You know, you have to have some honesty around, like, what is possible. But then also have a little bit of, like, optimism. Because probably more right. is possible than you would think. So it's like SEO. Um, we've got traffic. We've got uh, conversion potential or, like, the search intent. Like, so depending on if your goal is traffic or if your goal is conversions or business value, like, you got to figure out which goal that's going to be. And then you have to eliminate any actions that aren't going to get you towards that goal, right? Do you need the incremental 10 links a month or will two suffice and then you can focus more of your time and attention on bigger, better quality pieces? Like, think about Brian Dean, right? Like, he built his blog with, like, 25 blog posts. And sure, he did a lot of good link building, but he did it on a budget. Like, he did a lot of, like, scaled outreach and interesting research reports and, like, 10,000 word pieces. Like, that's what I would think about because he got fucking way outsized results. Like, he was beating the biggest companies in the world on the same terms that they were going after. Wow. So I think it is possible um, with a little bit of creativity, but yeah. so you that, just look at which dimensions you're aiming for, you know? That, uh, that spare cash or the, the money that you don't even see, what warrants, well, what did he say about wh- why his CEOs would touch that? Like, what, what would allow them to reach for that extra cash? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember if he talked about that. <laughs> It's been a couple of weeks since I listened to that podcast, but I would imagine if they're like going out of business or something, like you could probably, you probably yeah. reach into that cash reserve, I but I think it was pretty locked up. I imagine it might be like, Hey, we need to make a case for like a new hire. Here's why. And like, we're going to need some cash, like free up some cash or. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's like, why can't you use the other 60% of the revenue you're making to do that? You yeah, know, that, that's like the real a, question. Right. Yeah. It's like, wait, why are you, you, you must be running a business where the marketing function in a way where you're not you're spending more than you should be. Like, yeah. I think, I think if it's a forcing function to have that conversation versus yeah. just having that you can just, just dip into. It. That's yeah. the whole point. That's the whole yeah. point. Yeah. It, it, it removes that as the obvious way to solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the client I referred to earlier where they're like, what would it look like to spend more money on this? And it's like, they're not just going to blanket, hey, let's invest more. They're like, hey, can you help us like make a case for whether it makes sense? Like, so it forces that conversation. Yeah. Uh, let's cap back. it off, yeah? We back. Let's call it. Yeah. I love these discussions on creativity. How to think innovatively. I love that stuff. 
Should we have a tagline for closing out? And that's the way and that's the how the crumbles. cookie crumbles. <laughs> Just watch Bruce Almighty.